Hi class. Um, welcome to Phylum Arthropoda. This phylum, uh, their name actually means jointed foot. And that's because any of their appendages that you see are going to have a jointed appearance and they're segmented. This is one of the largest phyla. Actually, it is the largest phyla in the animal kingdom. And um, this set of notes has been divided, I think, into about five different sections, um, just so that it doesn't take you an hour to complete all of the notes. Um, you can take your time in between sets of notes, or you can go right through. I'll leave that up to you. You should have your outline in front of you, though, so that you can fill in the notes um, as you go through. So this is our evolutionary tree where um, you can see that we've we've talked about mollusks and annelids and now we're moving on. Arthropoda are a little bit more advanced than uh, the annelids. They do have an exoskeleton for protection. Um, so that's just where they lie on our cladogram. And the next one we'll complete, we're going to hop down to the other branch where the echinoderms are. You can see here for the wheel of species on our planet, as far as animals go, arthropoda are virtually taking over the world. There is a great number of species of arthropods, um, and as you'll see, they've actually had to create extra classification categories because there are so many. So arthropods are the most successful animals, and that's because they can pretty much live anywhere. They're adapted to live in the sea, in la on land, in the air. There's a large number of species, they're very diverse, and uh, their longevity is, is very good. Characteristics of arthropods, um, you can be filling these in on your note packet. They have segmented bodies in, and they're arranged in regions called tagmata. The tagmata would be things like the head, the thorax, the abdomen, uh, cephalothorax, and abdomen. And some of them are actually all fused and they're just kind of one whole body region. They do all have bilateral symmetry because they have a head end. They have paired jointed appendages, chitinous exoskeleton that they shed when they're growing. Um, the they do have an open circulatory system and it's located opposite ours. Um, they have a dorsal circulatory system and then they have a ventral nerve cord. Ours is the opposite. We have a dorsal nerve cord and a ventral circulatory system. And then many of the eyes on arthropods are compound eyes. So they have multiple lenses in their eyes and it helps them detect movement much more easily. Uh, just to go back and talk about how they're classified, arthropods as a whole, you, if you want to classify them or figure out what they are, you're going to base it on the number and structure of their body segments and their appendages. So do they have one body segment, two or three? And then you look to see how many pairs of legs are on these body segments. And that's how you figure out which uh, class you're talking about. And then their appendages that you look at, you have to figure out, you know, are they being used as walking legs? Are they modified appendages that are antenna? Do they have pinchers? Those types of characteristics will help you as well. So more reasons why they're so successful. They have a very versatile exoskeleton. Um, it keeps them from drying out. It's very uh, supportive structured so that it keeps their body organs um, located in the right places and protected. They all do have segmentation, which means their bodies can be a little bit more specialized. Um, and it's interesting because you can take an insect um, and try and hold their head underwater and they won't drown. And that's because the way that they get oxygen into their bodies is not located in their head. It's actually located in their abdomen. So they have these little holes and you can't really see it on the picture here, but they have holes in their abdomen called spiracles. 
and they're just little openings to the inside of the animal and they have tiny little tubes called tracheal tubes where the oxygen can travel throughout their body um, and then it's directly uh, linked to their cells. This is mainly for the uh, land animals. The um, arthropods that live in the ocean are going to have gills for gas exchange. Um, arthropods in general have very highly developed sense organs. They have large eyes to help them see light and movement. They've got um, antenna that help them sense their environment. Some of them have specialized taste um, cells that will help them identify things. They do have complex behaviors. Uh, if you take a look at bees or termites, they even have a caste system um, where there's workers and there's a queen and they all have a job to do. And we'll actually get into that in much more detail when we do, if you take animal behavior. And then another benefit for these guys is that they go through something called metamorphosis. And we'll, we'll talk about uh, the different types and why that's really beneficial um, later on in the notes. So this just gives you an image of all the jointed legs and segments in arthropods. Here are their uh, function of the, or the structure of the eye. They are compound eyes that have many lenses and not every single one of the arthropods has an eye like this. Some of them just have simple eyes. But when you're talking about a compound eye, this is what they look like. That right hand image is an electron microscope image up close of what these eyes look like. And if you imagine that each one of those little facets can see you coming, that's why it's so hard to swat a fly. And this diagram just shows you one example of a metamorphosis cycle. This would be the mosquito and um, it, you know, it lays its eggs in the water, the larva and the pupa live in the water and then um, hatch out and become the adults. Monarch butterfly, different type of metamorphosis, but it goes through its own uh, larval pupal stage. Here are two types of appendages that you'll encounter. There's biramus appendages and uniramus appendages. Biramus appendages, like on a crayfish leg, have two, uh, two divisions on the end of the appendage, and the uniramus appendage doesn't have any division, so it's just a single extension. So this is the chapter uh, that's going to be very helpful if you can remember your order of classification. What I mean by that is kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Because there is such diversity, um, they have created subphyla, and the subphyla goes after phylum but before the class. And um, they had to create these subphyla because there is such diversity and they needed a better way to differentiate these organisms. So we're going to start with subphylum trilobita. Uh, trilobites are extinct. They existed about 200 million years ago. They do have one pair of antenna and biramus appendages. And I'm sure you've seen these fossils. Um, if you took earth science, I'm sure you discussed them a bit as well. All right, so subphylum chelicerata. Chelicerae are jaws and they look like pincher-like mouth parts and there's certainly mouth parts that you don't want to get bitten by. This subphylum does not have any antenna and they do not have mandibles. They don't have a lower jaw. They do have two body regions. Usually it's combined into a cephalothorax and then an abdomen and they'll have four pairs of walking legs or eight legs. They have one pair of pedipalps. Those are up on their head and they help hold their food. Horseshoe crabs and arachnids are the only living groups in this subphylum. The arachnids include scorpions, pseudoscorpions, daddy long legs, mites, ticks, spiders. So we'll do the horseshoe crab first. This is class Merostomata. They um, have been found in the fossil record all the way back to the Triassic period 245 million years ago. 
they are covered by a carapace and it's a very large and it has that characteristic rounded look and then the long tail is called the telson and that happens to be a stinger for them and that's one of their defense mechanisms in this diagram you can see some of the uh, features on the back of the shell on the dorsal part of their carapace they have two compound eyes and a simple eye and you can see where um, they have a hinge between their cephalothorax and their abdomen. If you flip over the um, horseshoe crab, then you can see some more of their distinct features in this particular subphylum. They do have chelicerae. Um, you can see their eight legs. They do have some uh, assisting uh, features like uh, pedipalps. And then you can see their they do have gills because they live in the water and they need a way to exchange gases. All right, moving on to class Arachnida. This includes spiders, scorpions, ticks, and mites. Some characteristics about these guys. They do have two body segments still. Their body's constricted between their cephalothorax and their abdomen. So if you took a look at the horseshoe crabs again, there is no constriction. They just have a hinge in that area. These guys have a little waistline, if you will. Um, the mites and the ticks, their cephalothorax and their abdomen are fused, so they don't have a division. Um, and you'll see that in a, in a few slides. Most of the arachnids are predators. And what they will do typically is they'll inject enzymes into their prey and those enzymes will dissolve the prey and then they'll just kind of suck the fluid in through their pharynx. Spiders we'll talk about first. Spiders you can identify them because they will have eight legs. They do not have antenna. For excretory purposes they use something called malpighian tubules. Respiration they use something called book lungs or the trachea with spiracles. For they do have simple eyes with a single lens. Many of them will have multiple eyes, like eight eyes. They have chelicera, which are their fangs, and they do have spinnerets, so they can produce silk for webs. This just is a diagram showing you the division with the constriction between the two body segments. Here's another diagram just looking at a real spider. And here's a nice up close image of the chelicera. I would not want to get bitten by this. Here's a front view of the pedipalps on a spider. And these will help them in holding their food so that they can kind of chew it. Um, I was at the uh, library a couple weeks ago and they had a spider presentation and I actually learned how you can tell the difference between males and females on some species it doesn't work for all but on a species like this one if you look at the pedipalps they'll either have a boxing glove look like this guy or it'll be more straight if they look like they have boxing gloves then it's a male and if it's more straight then it's a female so this happens to be a male spider. Side view just showing you parts of the respiratory system, the book lungs and the spiracles. The spiracles are going to be on the sides of their body. Um, you can see the like the greenish area is going to be their book lungs in the front where the spiracles are attached. Spinnerets, uh, they will release silk for webs, are usually located on the back of the abdomen. And here's the same diagram you have in your notes. You'll want to uh, label it so that you can remember where the pedipalps are, the chelicera, and then the divisions of the cephalothorax and the abdomen. Okay, moving on to more detail, the order Araneae. These are spiders, and these spiders will have fangs with poison glands. They do have silk glands in this order as well.
So if you are like many people, you either don't mind spiders or you really, really hate them. One of the ones that uh, people really don't like are tarantulas because they tend to be rather large, although they're very benign as far as contact with humans. They don't live in, in New York State, first of all, um, so you'll never encounter one of these out in the wild, but um, they're really not predators or bothersome to humans. But they're, they are pretty big and they're furry looking. So this is one of the spiders that is bothersome to humans and they do live in our area. These are black widow spiders. And you can see um, on the left hand picture, they are all black. If you were to look at their belly, that's where they have that hourglass red symbol on them. Um, they what they do is they secrete a neurotoxin neurotoxins affect the nervous system so they're gonna paralyze their prey when they bite their prey these guys are bad um, for humans to get bitten by you can acquire multiple symptoms and they they cause some complications for you here's the other uh, spider that you want to stay away from these are the brown recluse uh, some people call them the fiddleback spiders, but they are going to secrete a necrotoxin. Necrotoxin causes necrosis or tissue death. Um, the way to identify them, in case you've never seen one, is the, the left-hand picture is actually better for this. If you look at the, the cephalothorax area, it kind of looks like a violin on its side and that's why they're called fiddleback spiders because it looks like a fiddle or a violin. I will warn you that the next couple slides that I'll show you are going to be graphic. I'm going to show you some people who have been bitten by brown recluse and how bad some of these bites can really get. This particular um, image just shows you actually mild necrosis of tissue but the tissue is dying in the area where they bite you. This person was bitten uh, by a brown recluse on his left thumb and this is day three after the bite. Now we have day four and you can see the infected air or affected area is getting bigger and redder and more purple. Day five you can see some necrosis starting under the skin there. Day six, you can see a lot more necrosis occurring. Here's day nine. And you can see there's some stitches um, hanging off his hand. And if you look in the background, you can see he's in a, an, either in a doctor's office or in a hospital room. These can get pretty bad. And especially on your hand, there's not a lot of space for that necrotoxin to go, so it's going to start killing a lot of tissue. And I think they're just using stitches to kind of hold the skin on his hand um, as it dies. And, and basically, you there's really no antidote for this. Your body just has to kind of break it down and get rid of it. And it, it can cause a lot of damage while you're waiting. Here's day 10. Um, this is the last slide. I don't know what the fate of this man's thumb was, um, but you can see how awful. And I can only imagine the cartilage and any muscle underneath, maybe even the bone, how all that got affected. Um, you definitely want to get treatment immediately so that, you know, maybe they can help treat it symptomatically before it gets really, really bad. But it definitely try and not upset this type of a spider. All right, order Scorpionidia. Um, these are the scorpions, and they have large pedipalps that help them hold their food. They do have chelicerae, and they have an abdominal stinger that they use to um, poison their prey. Here's a diagram showing scorpion anatomy. And then we move on to the order Acari. This includes ticks and mites. And you can see how their body segments are fused. They just kind of have one big area. Here's an example of a couple ticks that 
um, you probably want to stay away from and you want to protect your animals, your pets, your dogs and cats from these guys. They're the dog tick and the wood tick. They do transmit diseases um, and usually it's because they're attached and draining blood and while they're doing that they're secreting uh, saliva which keeps your blood from coagulating and that's where the bacteria is located that they're usually passing on and making people sick. This is uh, some people that have contracted Rocky Mountain spotted fever and um, it's from a tick bite. The ticks carry the bacteria and inject them into you and then you get sick. You will have a high fever, headache, muscle pain. Um, you get a rash, and it usually starts on your extremities. And it's 25% fatal if you don't get treated for it with antibiotics. Other uh, types of tick-borne diseases would be Lyme disease um, that people end up getting. And just a microscopic view of a tick. Here's another one that, um, this is a mite that can be bothersome for people, especially those that have allergies. Um, people who are allergic to dust mites are actually allergic to their feces. One gram of dust in your house can hold 250,000 droppings. Dust mites are everywhere. Um, they are very, very small, so you'll probably never see them. And they're actually good to have because they they feed off of your dead skin. The majority of dust in your house is skin that has come off your body and they help break it down so you don't have gigantic piles of dead skin in your house. Um, but the people that have allergies, this will be a, a pretty big problem for them. And then here we have little chigger mites. If you've ever looked at a rock and seen all these little uh, red things running around, those are chigger mite larvae and they do bite. Some people are more sensitive to their bites and they get a dermatitis or itchy skin from them. Um, so, you know, you don't really want them running around on you. Well, that takes us to the end of this section. Um, you can pick up with part two right away or you can pause and come back to it later.